Okay, thanks for the introduction. <coughs> um, I'm Nils Asmussen from uh, the TH Dresden and from the Barkhausen Institute, and I, this is joint work with uh, Michael Reich and Hermann Hertig. Uh, and it's about M3X. Is that, am I, no? Is that okay? From the, okay. <laughs> Um, and this talk is about M3X uh, that um, yeah, runs accelerators autonomously and combines fast path communication with context switching. So let me start by breaking apart the title. Um, the first part of our work is on a, a, autonomous accelerators um, because today accelerators typically need to be assisted by the CPU because, for example, they cannot access operating system services like file systems or network stacks on their own. And this leads to a high CPU load caused by the operating system and also prevents us from actually benefiting from the energy efficiency of the accelerators because we need to power the CPU most of the time during their runtime as well. The second part of our work focuses on fast path communication. And previous work has already shown that pinning applications on cores and having a direct communication channel between them that bypasses the operating system kernel leads to significant performance improvements. And examples are our own previous work, M3, and also DLibOS, for example. Um, however, the problem is that in contrast to slow path communication that you can see at the top here, where the kernel is involved, um, fast path communication doesn't combine well with context switching. And this is because if the kernel is not involved in the communication, how can the sender determine whether the receiver is actually running? And if it's not running, how can it deliver the message otherwise? And also, how can the kernel make scheduling or placement decisions if it doesn't know whether the application is currently computing or is waiting for a message, for example? So we need to solve several problems in order to support that. In our work, we uh, rethink the system architecture based on our previous work, M3. Um, M3 is a hardware operating system co-design for heterogeneous systems. Um, we also have real hardware for a subset of the features, but in this work, we use simulation based on Gem5 to evaluate the system. Um, in contrast to others, we do not build upon cache coherency uh, because it's still unclear how future sy systems look like, so whether they will be, will be globally coherent or partially coherent or non-coherent, and this is why we keep that optional. Uh, and last but not least, we focus in this work on uh, so-called fixed function accelerators uh, because they are arguably the most difficult uh, ones to support as first-class citizens uh, because they provide none of the features that operating systems classically need um, to, to, to run there, like user kernel mode, memory management unit, and so on, because fixed function accelerators do not even execute software. Okay, uh, in terms of related work, um, there are also other works that try to achieve similar goals. At first, for one specific accelerator, for example, there is a GPUFS and GPUNet uh, for GPUs that tries to um, give them access to operating system services, and the same exists for FPGAs with uh, F uh, weak kernel S and BORF. Um, there's also work on context switching on GPUs, uh, for example, by Chimera. Uh, and there are entire operating systems for heterogeneous systems um, like Barrelfish, Popcorn Linux, uh, K2, and Helios. So I don't want to do a detailed comparison here um, because the main difference is that these works uh, do not consider hardware changes and, do not, and, and therefore have to stop early. So let's see what we can do if we consider hardware changes. So I want to start here with giving you the uh, key techniques that we use to, to solve the problems. So the first one is that we add a uniform interface to these potentially very heterogeneous compute units. The second one is that we use simple and generic protocols between these compute units, uh, for example, to um, give them access to operating system services and use the same protocols for all of these compute units. And last but not least, we uh, don't expect the accelerators to um, have the features that operating systems need, uh, but instead we want to add a lightweight component externally to them uh, in order to speak these protocols that we use. Okay, so the rest of the talk is structured as follows. I will start with the background on M3. Uh, I will then continue uh, with showing how we, how we can use the fast path communication that is already given by M3 in this case uh, to build um, accelerators or to, to run accelerators autonomously. And finally, I will show how we can uh, combine this fast path communication with context switching. So let me start with the background. Um, so the uniform interface that I mentioned earlier is, uh, in case of M3, given by the so-called data transfer unit, the DTU, which is sitting next to each compute unit. And this allows these compute units to inter interact with each other, for example, uh, using message passing. So now that we have this uniform interface, we can forget about the differences among these compute units for, for a minute and just call them CUs. 
Um, so we have now a bunch of tiles integrated with some interconnect and we have in each tile a CU, a compute unit and a DTU. In terms of the operating system, uh, the idea of M3 is that the kernel is running on a dedicated tile, the so-called kernel tile, and the applications are running on the other tiles, the user tiles, and are remotely controlled by the kernel. M3 already provides fast path communication, um, and it has two different types of uh, communication channels. The first one is a memory channel, and the second one is a message passing channel. Um, to represent these channels, the DTU provides so-called endpoints. So these are hardware resources that uh, represent these communication channels. Um, the first channel is, as I said, the, uh, a memory channel, which is uh, represented by this memory endpoint that you can see. And this allows, in this example, the user tile to access the piece of uh, data in, in DRAM. The message passing channel is represented by a send endpoint, endpoint and a receive endpoint, and this allows these two user tiles here to exchange messages. So in both cases, this is fast path communication in the sense that although the kernel is involved to establish this communication channel, uh, it is not involved in the actual communication. So after setting that up, the user tiles are communicating directly without involving the kernel again. Okay, so let us see now how we can use that to run accelerators autonomously. The end goal is that we want to have an arbitrary graph of compute units interacting with each other. In this case, I'm focusing on a pipeline. So we have this shell command here that we want to execute consisting of different parts that we want to execute on the compute unit that fits it best in each case. So we have at first the shell that is going to execute that. We have um, at first a decode application, so normal software that is decoding a PAG image in this example. And then we have three hardware accelerators that do the actual image processing. And finally, we write the results, uh, uh, the raw pixel data here in this example, into the output file to do post-processing later. Between these, we have pipes and output redirections to, to connect them. So the question is now, what do we need in order to support that? So at first, we need generic protocols that allows us to arbitrarily combine these compute units with, e with each other. And second, the accelerators, of course, need to support these protocols as well to be embedded in such a command, which means they need to be simple and also need to be flexible enough to meet the demands of software. To explain that, I will use the uh, last part of the command here, the, uh, the part where the IFFT accelerator writes the results directly to the output file. So let me start with, with the generic protocol. The protocol is called file protocol in the Unix sense of everything is a file. And the idea is that the data is stored in memory and there is a message passing channel between the client, so the IFFT accelerator, this example, and, and the server, the file system. And this allows the, the client to request access to um, the data stored in memory. The actual data access is done with a memory endpoint on the client side, and this is configured on behalf of these requests by the server. So the client can go to the server and request access to the next piece of input, for example, and then the server will configure its, uh, the memory endpoint of the client, and afterwards the client can use its DTU to access the data without involving the server again. I also want to highlight here that this protocol is not a special protocol for accelerators, but this is the uh, general, file system, uh, general operating system service access protocol that is used by all kinds of compute units. Okay, so the second part that we need to uh, support this shell command is that we need to um, add the corresponding parts to the accelerator to support these protocols. Um, and I want to reuse here uh, off-the-shelf accelerators, so I do not want to change them. And in this case, I'm focusing on accelerators that prefer scratchpad memory, which is often done because that gives you a constant access latency and also allows many parallel memory accesses. There are also other types of accelerators, uh, for example, accelerators that prefer cache-based memory, memory access, and we have that in the paper. Uh, in the talk here, I will focus on these accelerators. So what do we need to add? The first component that we add as for every compute unit is the DTU. The second component is the uh, accelerator support module, which is sitting between the accelerator logic and the DTU. And most importantly, it implements the file protocol for both the input and the output channel. So as you can see, each of the channels has a um, send endpoint to talk to the server and a memory endpoint to actually access the data. So what the ASM is doing is it, it first loads the first block of data over the input channel into the scratchpad memory, is then invoking the accelerator logic to compute on that data, and if that's finished, the result is pushed uh, from the scratchpad memory over the output channel to the output file in this, uh, this example. 
Okay, so what are the benefits of this? Um, to see that, let's re let us compare the autonomous approach that M3X enables with the traditional assisted approach. So you can see the assisted approach here, where we have um, an operating system with some driver that is driving these, uh, this image processing uh, accelerator chain here. And the, assist, the, the autonomous approach looks like this. We have also an operating system that in this case only needs to set up <coughs> this uh, chain of accelerators and the actual work is done by the accelerator support modules. So I want to highlight two crucial differences here. The first difference is in the data path where on the left side, as you can see, the operating system is doing all the file accesses to the input and the output file and needs to <coughs> also feed the accelerators with the data and also pull it out again at the end. Uh, on the right side, as you can see, the accelerators are directly accessing the input file and also directly accessing the output file. The second difference is in the control path, where on the left side, the operating system needs to drive the DMA units in order to, to move the data from accelerator to accelerator. On the right part, um, on the right side, we have, um, have this done by the ASMs, by having an optimized version of the file protocol where the accelerators are directly connected. So in this case, also the operating system is not part of the execution. Okay, so let us see what that means in numbers. Um, to compare that, we have this image processing, this physical image processing accelerators here, and we have a chain of activities, how we call that, um, running on these accelerators and an input file and an output file. And maybe we want to do multiple image processings in parallel, and therefore we have multiple of these physical accelerator chains, each having a virtual chain on top of them. So since these uh, physical chains run in parallel, you would expect that if there is no operating system overhead, um, that the runtime is always the same. And if we look at the results, we can see for the autonomous approach, this is actually the case. But for the assisted approach, there's a bit of a slowdown because of these frequent interactions between accelerators and the CPU. And even more importantly, you can see that the CPU load caused by the operating system is pretty high for the assisted approach and uh, very low for the autonomous approach. And this is actually the good case because in this scenario, we have integrated the CPU cores and the accelerators in a system on a chip. So there's a low latency between them. If we connect the accelerators with the PCIe-like latency to the CPU, then the results look even more severe. So as you can see on the right, we have almost 90% of CPU load even with one of these chains. Um, and this also leads to a more slowdown on the left because the CPU is just overloaded beginning at two chains. Okay, now that we have autonomous accelerators, let me explain how we can combine that with context switching um, to use the hardware resources more efficiently. So I don't want to go into the details here, um, but the main takeaway is that we also have a generic protocol for context switching between the kernel that is doing the decision making and the helpers that on the user tiles where the context switch is happening um, that just do save and restore. And this allows us to support context switches both on general purpose cores and also on accelerators. But I want to come back to the questions or the, the problems that are raised at the beginning uh, that arise when you combine fast path communication with context switching. So if the sender on the left here uh, wants to send a message to the receiver on the right, the question is how does he know whether he is running? So how can we solve that problem? And we decided to solve that by letting the DTU know uh, about the running activity and also letting the DTU know about the recipient of a communication. So if the sender on the left here sends a, uh, a message to the activity two on the right, everything is fine because the ID two is matching. But if th there's another communication channel that, that allows activity one to send to activity three, also to the tile on the right as the receiver because maybe the activity three was running there before, then the IDs don't match and the DTU reports an error back to the, to the sender. So the next question is, what does the sender do with this error? And we decided to yeah, basically fall back to slow path communication in such a case and forward the message over the kernel to the recipient. And the kernel will then start by scheduling the activity three in this example, if it's not already running. Um, and afterwards, send the message on behalf of the original sender to the activity three. Okay, so now that we can context switch or share accelerators between multiple applications. Um, let us come back to this image processing example. So we again have these one to four chains. And in this case, we want to share them as I said, and therefore we have two of these virtual chains running on, on each physical chain and we switch between them. So the question is, what kind of overhead does this introduce? 
Of course, that depends at first on the number of accelerator chains or the number of accelerators we have to context switch, and also on the time slice, so how, how often do we context switch. Um, and if, as you can see, if we do that once per millisecond, then we have a one to 2% overhead. But if we increase the time slices or reduce the frequency, then uh, it is below 1% even with four of these accelerator chains, so 12 accelerators to context switch. Okay, in conclusion, M3X enables autonomous accelerators and combines fast path communication with context switching by at first adding a uniform interface to all the compute units, um, second, using simple and generic protocols, for example, for operating system service access, and by adding a lightweight component to accelerators if that's necessary, instead of requiring them to provide the features. And this, as I have shown, reduces the CPU load by a factor of 30. And um, also, at the, on the one hand, we retain the advantages of fast path communication, as we show in the paper, um, but also we can, at the same time, use the hardware resources more efficiently by supporting context switching. If you want to know more about M3, there's another talk called SempreOS in the next session um, where we show how we can scale an M3-based system up to hundreds of compute units. And with this, I'm happy to take your questions. <clears throat> questions? So, I have a, I have a question and maybe I, uh... I spend too much time in the networking world, but in the networking world, we, we talk about concepts like flow control and data placement and DMA and congestion management. And I'd be interested if you could just maybe replay what you had talked, what you had mentioned with, your, with respect to your design in a networking terminology, because the terms, the terminology used is very different, but at the end of the day, it feels very similar to what you would have normally in if you were to build a, a flow controlled network. Hmm. So I think I'm not enough networking expert to use the terms. <laughs> um, so do you, do you have a specific example? Yeah, so for example, you're, it's not clear whether the, the, mess, the queues are flow controlled or not. Or what is the flow control mechanism? Ah, okay. Um, so at, at, the, at the receiver side, we have a buffer, a receive buffer where the messages are put into. And um, we use a credit system to, to manage that. So the client, senders have credits, and if they have credits, they know that there's space for this message. Thank you, that's a great answer. Yes. Thanks, great work. Si uh, Yu from Dangook University. Uh, what if there is a reverse uh, backward uh, dependency? A backwards dependency? Meaning um, if the data in the next stage is required from the former stages. Ah, so the example that I used is stream processing, so this doesn't happen. You have just, you see every data just once. Um, we have another type of accelerator in the paper which we call a request processing accelerator, so where you get access to the whole data at once, um, and then you can do fine granular accesses to, to, this, um, to this data. Um, and there you could just go back and forth however, however you like. Okay, so you are sending your data in the backward? In the case? So in this case, it's a cache-based access strategy with this request processing accelerator. So you do not send data around, you just have a memory mapping and the cache that allows you to access this mapping, and then you can just do the accesses however you like. Okay, great, thanks. Um, great paper. Um, do you see the state of your research at a stage where you could offer these designs and specs to logic vendors so they can put it in front of the various accelerators within SOCs, or do you still need to do a lot of more work? Um, so, so actually, we are about to do that. So um, in the Backhausen Institute, we continue the research uh, on, on this project, and we, we have um, hardware engineers in the team that will uh, build the DTU in hardware, and therefore, I think, at least we think at the moment that we are ready for that. Let's see if we are. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker once again.